so uh, I think we're ready to start. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Ron Ziemba, representing the Gordon Welchman Program Committee. We've been working on this for a year, uh, so uh, I think we're ready. We're ready. We believe we've got a very engaging program for you tonight, and uh, we're going to begin immediately with Mayor Holiday, who has a very special proclamation to present. And David Jones, where's David? Can you come up to please to accept this proclamation? David was the first person in our group to suggest more than a year ago that we should have a program celebrating Gordon Wilson. Mayor? Thank you, Ron. David? Good evening, everyone, and welcome. It is uh, my pleasure to be here with all of you tonight. I do apologize in advance. I would much rather be sitting here listening to this story than having to go to a city council. <laughs> but anyway, I'm thrilled to be here to present this proclamation in the, at the start of your program. Whereas Gordon Welshman was born in 1906 in Fish Ponds, Bristol, England, between 1925 and 1928, he studied at Marlborough College followed by studies as a mathematics scholar at Trinity College. As a research fellow in mathematics at Sydney Sussex College, and in 1932 as a fellow, and later as a dean of that college, Gordon's career appeared to be on track. And whereas, before World War II, Gordon was invited to join the government code and cipher school at Bachelor Park? Thank you. Uh, England's top secret code breaking center. Being one of four early recruits who made significant contributions, the four became known as the Wicked Uncles. Most of his work was based on what was known as traffic analysis of the encrypted German communication, the practice of examining parts of messages such as message origination message destination, time and date information, etc., which was easier than attacking cryptographic ciphers directly. Westman was credited with his innovating approach to code breaking, and whereas Welshman's enhanced the design of the Polish electromechanical Enigma cipher breaking machine named the Bomb, and his improvement of the diagonal board made the device substantially more efficient in the attack on ciphers generated by the German Enigma machine. This code-breaking work led directly to the sinking of the Nazi battleship Bismarck and reportedly shortened the war by two years. Whereas, after the war, Welshman moved to the United States. In 1948, Gordon taught the first computer course at MIT. In 1962, Gordon became an American citizen and that same year joined the Mitre Corporation working on secure communication systems in the U.S. military. He retired in 1971 and spent the last 14 years of his life in his adopted Newburyport, a city he greatly loved. Therefore, be it resolved that I, Donna D. Holliday, Mayor of the City of Newburyport, hereby invite all residents to join in celebrating the extraordinary hero of World War II. Given under my hand and seal this 28th day of March in the year 2017, Donna D. Holliday, Mayor. I know you have to piece me off, but we are very grateful to you for being here. And I'm very grateful that you're taping this so that I can see it at the end. Yes, thank you. Enjoy the program tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mayor Holiday. We really appreciate your joining us to make this proclamation. And uh, we know you need to get back to City Hall for a thrilling City Council meeting. Okay, uh, our program tonight is a program of appreciation and celebration 
about an amazing man who helped to make the world a better place in large ways and in small ways on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean. It's about mathematical genius, as you've heard, about World War II, as you've heard, and the defeat of Hitler, and curiously enough, it's about the cloud. More about that later. Uh, it's also very much about Newburyport, where Gordon uh, lived in the house at 167 Water Street, now, now a B&B, uh, for the last 14 years of his life. I might just note in passing, one of the things we found out in the course of our research was that house at 167 Water Street was owned at one point by none other than Bossy Gillis <laughs> and his wife and his mother, Hannah. Uh, Welshman remains pretty much unknown today, except by the few true aficionados of World War II code breaking. Despite all of his uh, accomplishments, uh, he sort of lived in a shadow up to now. And we hope we can do something about that tonight. Uh, Gene Doyle, who's a member of our Welshman Program Committee, has done some significant research on Newburyport during the war years. And Gene points out that life in Newburyport was very different during those years. Many of you who were here then had family members or friends who served the country in World War II. And too many of them were lost. But more of them returned to Newburyport after the war and helped to make it the great place it is today. It's interesting to speculate, says Jean, how many might not have returned were it not for the work of Gordon Welchman and his fellow code breakers at Bletchley Park. Newburyport is said to be the kind of place that attracts interesting and even fascinating people from all walks of life to come to live here. Gordon Welchman certainly was one of those people. During his 14 years in Newburyport, Welchman was involved in the life of this city in a number of ways. You'll hear about many of them tonight. And we think you'll agree that Gordon was not just a mathematical genius and war hero, but a man with wide-ranging interests and opinions, and a pretty decent sense of humor as well. As they say, a man in full. We're gonna begin in a moment with a BBC documentary about Welshman, which has been distributed in the United States by the Smithsonian Channel. You may have seen it recently. The documentary runs about 35 minutes and provides a good summary of Gordon's life and accomplishments. Following the documentary, we're gonna present a panel consisting entirely of people who knew Gordon when he lived in Newburyport. Uh, there we'll offer some personal stories and reminiscences to give you a look from a different perspective at, at the man. We're hoping to close the program by 8.30, but maybe a little later than that now, uh, with questions and comments from the audience, since we feel there might be others in the audience who might have known Gordon when he lived here and would have an interesting story to share. So be thinking about that. So uh, here is the BBC Smithsonian documentary called Rather, rather sensationalistically, though not inaccurately, the code breaker who hacked Hitler. <laughs> <laughs> It's one of the most astonishing stories of the Second World War. As Nazi forces crushed all who opposed them, a small group of geniuses based in a British country house fought back, and the codebreakers won. The most famous of all was Alan Turing, whose story told in the Oscar-winning movie The Imitation Game has gripped the world. But there's one name that was left out of the film and largely forgotten. A code breaker who should be as famous as Turing himself. His name is Gordon Welshman. Without him, the Nazi codes might never have been broken. The war could have lasted two more years and tens of thousands would have died. When I was a child, there was always in the family the sense that 
Dad had done, done something quite important during the war, but of course we didn't really know the details and it couldn't really be talked about. His achievements didn't end with World War II. He would move to the United States, where he'd play a critical role in the Cold War and change the face of the modern battlefield. With Edward Snowden's revelations of total global surveillance, we have now discovered Welshman's legacy continues to this day. But when Gordon Welshman chose to come out of the shadows and reveal his secrets, the dark world of espionage to which he had given so much ruined him. September 1939. As Britain declared war on Nazi Germany, an extraordinary motley army was being assembled at Bletchley Park in the English countryside near London to fight a secret war. Their mission was to crack one of the hardest codes ever devised, created on a machine called Enigma. Enigma lay at the heart of Hitler's armed forces communications system. Bletchley Park staff consisted of chess masters, crossword addicts, and bridge fanatics. If they could break into Enigma, they might just save the world from the Nazis. The best and the brightest were being recruited from Britain's top universities. Two of this elite were the renowned mathematician Alan Turing and the dean of a Cambridge college, Gordon Welshman. Gordon Welshman was actually quite glamorous. He was good looking and he knew he was good looking. He had a way with the ladies. He was fantastically bright, uh, very pugnacious, obviously a very proud man. He did mountain climbing, he did sailing, um, he loved dancing. He was a man who'd clearly been watching Hollywood movies. He was kind of Errol Flynn and Robert Donat. It's very much that kind of dashing young chap kind of feel to him, as opposed to the shambling absent-mindedness of many of his colleagues. Welshman was one of the original elite codebreakers, given the Herculean task of decoding the Enigma machine. Enigma used a combination of rotors, plugs, and wiring to put German messages into secret code. There were one in 159 million, million, million possible combinations. Breaking it looked impossible. While others sought to crack the codes, Welshman took a different approach. Instead, he focused on what would come to be known as traffic analysis. The body of the message was unreadable, but the first few letters and numbers were not in code. This was the call sign, the address, identifying who the message was to and from. There was crucial information in the call signs, and Welshman started to track it, linking up who was sending and receiving the messages, where they were, where they went. It was a brilliantly simple observation, yet it would prove crucial. They call it chat that comes over the air. And by this means, we can build up a picture of a German unit of the Air Force, for example, the headquarters, any outstations it has, and how they keep in touch with it and so on and send messages. We were dealing with an entire communication system that would serve the needs of the German forces. The call signs came alive as representing those forces whose commanders would have to send messages to each other. Just using traffic analysis, Welshman started to reveal the precise enemy forces that faced the Allies. Modern code breaking was born. And they had a big wall map, and you could visually see the whole setup of the German communication system. Traffic analysis was Bletchley's first major breakthrough. Without an analysis of traffic, you would never have been able to use cryptography to win the war. 
When you hear phrases like traffic analysis or signals intelligence, uh, it doesn't immediately sound quite so, so glamorous, really. Uh, and I think possibly that's one of the reasons why Gordon Welshman hasn't been recognised so much. But if people knew just how absolutely he was the kind of spine of the entire Bletchley Park operation, then they would look at him in a completely new way. The Enigma codes had still not been broken. But Welshman now knew the exact position and strength of thousands of German troops and hundreds of aircraft. It made him realize that Bletchley Park could become as forceful a part of Britain's defenses as the Army, Navy, and Air Force. Their weapon would be intelligence. No one else seemed to be doing anything about this potential gold mine. So I drew up a comprehensive plan, which called for the close coordination of radio interception, analysis of the intercepted traffic, breaking Enigma keys, decoding messages on the broken keys, and extracting intelligence from the decodes. It was the end of 1939, before open warfare between Britain and Germany had begun. Welshman was pushing for a total reorganization of Bletchley Park, a radical plan that would require far more people and resources than a collection of crossword fanatics and professors solving puzzles. Welshman went to his boss. He won high-level approval for my plan, and we were able to start recruiting the high-quality staff that would be needed. Welshman created what was called Hut 6, a modest name that belied the magnitude of just what was achieved within its walls. We had two or three or four little lights hanging on wires from the ceiling, and we had collapsible chairs and tables. It really wasn't for a high-powered government machine. And I was a bit of a romantic, and I thought, well, you know, I might get involved in some clandestine operations. Here, brilliant people made breakthroughs that helped change the course of the war. All were sworn to the utmost secrecy. Welshman would remain head of Hut 6 until 1943. In May 1940, Hitler's panzers invaded France. And Bletchley Park at last found a way to read some Enigma messages. The intelligence they contained was codenamed Ultra, and it made for horrifying reading. The Nazis were driving Allied forces back towards the English Channel. British, French, and Belgian troops were fighting desperately. 30 years after the war, in the only filmed interview Welshman ever gave, he revealed how Ultra had saved thousands of British lives. In the Battle of France, probably the most important thing which came out of Ultra was that it was realized so early that uh, we were in a hopeless position. Hut 6 had been established just in time. Bletchley Park had revealed the troops in France were surrounded. They needed to escape now. The evacuation of Dunkirk began and it was decided to get out as quick as we could. And this meant that there was time to organize. Hut 6 had saved nearly 340,000 lives and prevented the annihilation of the British Army. Its success was a testament to Welshman's steely-eyed vision. Well, I think he was the right person at the right time. I think he probably had a lot of personal characteristics that were really vital for his work here. For Bletchley Park and Gordon Welshman, it was just the beginning. By the end of 1940, Hut 6 under Gordon Welshman was at the heart of the whole Bletchley Park operation. Here, they used traffic analysis to select and target particular German radio networks and operators. 
Their traffic was then intercepted and decoded thanks to a remarkable new electromechanical device designed by Alan Turing. It was helping to break key enigma signals on a daily basis. It was called the bomb. It simulated all the possible configurations of the enigma machine. The bomb could check them hundreds of times faster than the smartest human. But it was very limited. To run a test, known as a bomb run, it needed to compare a short phrase from the code with what the code breakers guessed might be the original message. For example, many German messages might begin with the words, Heil Hitler. This guessed text was known as a crib. If they were right in their guess, the bomb could start cracking the code. But they needed accurate cribs. Welshmen realized the German operators were only human. Like anyone else, they would fall into bad habits. And if they could target these habits, Bletchley might have a shortcut to break the codes. What Welshmen discovered was that by understanding the way that the Germans used the communications, you could start to predict more easily where particular types of message would come. There was a German commander in Brittany somewhere who, during the war, regularly sent in every morning a message saying, uh, Alice in Ordnung, everything's OK here. It was the same phrase he used every morning, which was a, a godsend to the decryptors in Hut 6. Armed with a crib, the Bletchley team could now start a bomb run and hope to find the Enigma settings. But it was a race against time. German codes were changed at midnight, and the bomb might take days to find an answer. Even if they cracked the code, it could be too late to help the Allies. Welshman's genius was to come up with a modification of Alan Turing's brilliant design and make it work many times faster. It's Gordon Welshman who spots the one thing that the machines need that could give them an almost uncanny elegance and beauty in the way that they worked. Welshman came up with an inspired, improvised solution. It was called the diagonal board. A simple electrical circuit enabled the bomb to cross-check hundreds of possible combinations at the same time. It reduced bomb runs from days down to hours or even minutes. Hut 6 could now read German messages, sometimes before they were even read by the intended enemy recipient. So here we see an example of Gordon Welshman's fantastic mathematical intelligence coming through, easily a match for that of Alan Turing. By 1941, Bletchley's decodes were starting to change the course of the war. A German battleship, the Bismarck, was scouring the Atlantic, destroying British shipping, and threatening the nation's survival. The main part of our fleet was out pursuing the Bismarck. She was the latest German ship and the best thing they'd got in the Navy, and very important. On May 24, 1941, the Bismarck sank the pride of the British Navy, HMS Hood, Britain's most modern and biggest battlecruiser. 1,400 British sailors lost their lives. Only three of its crew survived. Winston Churchill ordered the Royal Navy to find and destroy the Bismarck, but they had no way of knowing where it was. At Bletchley, Welshman's team believed they might be able to use intelligence to find it. Sifting through the entirety of German naval communications for any reference to the Bismarck was a daunting challenge. What I had to do was to take the Enigma telegrams as they arrived in Hut 6, and I had to put them into the machine. Then I had to look at them and see whether they were all in German, of course, see whether they appeared to be of any interest. Then the breakthrough they had been hoping for 
We discovered this message from a German commander to the commander of the Bismarck saying, where are you going? I'm worried about my son who is on board. And the message came back, which I got, which said Brest. At last, they had a location. The Bismarck was heading for the port of Brest in northern France, being used by the German Navy. A powerful Royal Navy battle group of 13 vessels was ordered to hunt down the Bismarck. In this, perhaps the most dramatic naval film ever taken, you will see salvos from the Bismarck failing to hit one of our battleships. This was during the chase right across the Atlantic while the Nazi ship was running from the guns of our squadron. A torpedo dropped from a British biplane disabled the Bismarck. The British warships closed in. We were all absolutely on our toes, wondering what was going to come through next, because we knew it was one of the major battles of the war. When these pictures were taken during the action, the Bismarck was nearing her end. Hut 6 had the satisfaction of decoding the very last message sent from the stricken Bismarck. Ship unmanageable. We shall fight to the last shell. Long live the Fuhrer. And eventually they sank her. This flagship of Hitler's Navy went down with over 2,000 of its crew. I mean, that was a day to remember. We were constructing a jigsaw, but half the pieces were missing. Now it all made a picture and all the jigsaw came together. We were invigorated immediately. It was Britain's first significant victory in the darkest days of World War II. Bletchley Park had proved that intelligence could sink ships. It was a weapon the Allies were determined to use to the limit. Under Welshman supervision, a ramshackle collection of wooden huts became the world's first intelligence factory. Rebuilt in brick on a whole new scale. A handful of code breakers became thousands working around the clock. Two bombs became 200. Bletchley Park was breaking Enigma daily revealing the inner secrets of the German war machine. And it was changing the course of the war. They tapped into Field Marshal Erwin Rommel's battle plans, and his forces were driven out of North Africa. They located the U-boat wolf packs lurking in the Atlantic, and they were hunted down. And thanks to Bletchley, the Allies knew their D-Day deception had worked. Hitler believed the real invasion was yet to come and held back the panzers that might have driven the Allies into the sea. For the very first time, code breaking had made a significant difference to a war. Bletchley is credited with hastening the Nazi defeat by two years. That's enough to have saved thousands or hundreds of thousands of lives. By the time the war ended in 1945, Bletchley Park had transformed military intelligence. The brains at Bletchley had taken on the brawn of the Teutonic Army and won. And Welshman was at the heart of it. To think of him as the Henry Ford of cryptography is not a bad metaphor. The industrialization of cryptography, that's an astonishing achievement. His legacy is in uh, what Bletchley Park achieved, what Bletchley Park contributed to the success and the Allied victory in, in 1945. Um, it's hard to have a bigger legacy than that. One war was over, but another was about to start. It would see a remarkable contribution from Gordon Welshman but at a devastating personal cost. 
After the end of the Second World War, the legacy of the work of Bletchley Park and Hut 6 would endure. Gordon Welshman's creation would find itself the model for the National Security Agency, the NSA, and its British equivalent, GCHQ. The future lay in computers. And while Bletchley had once led the world, Welshman now believed bankrupt Britain was squandering its technological lead. You also have a sense of a man who understands very, very well about the computer revolution, the computer age that's about to come into being, because this is a computer age that was brought into being at Bletchley Park. Welshman was determined to stay at the forefront of the computer revolution. That meant America. In 1971, Welshman moved to the New England town of Newburyport and married his third wife, Teenie. He was now 65 and still at the peak of his powers. He had made a decisive impact on both the Second World War and now the Cold War. Yet everything he had achieved was known only within his clandestine world. Fighting an intelligence war against the Soviet Union, the US and British governments had kept the success of Bletchley Park secret for two decades. Everyone who worked there had been sworn to silence. But then in 1974, came an event that had unexpectedly far-reaching consequences. The Ultra Secret, a government-approved book by an ex-MI6 officer revealed for the first time the role of code-breaking in winning the Second World War. Suddenly, daylight was being let in on a hitherto secret world. It was a shocking moment for all those like Welshmen, who had taken their oath of secrecy so seriously. For years and years, I didn't even read the histories of, of the war, because I was afraid that somehow or other I might reveal um, something that I'd learned from Ultra. I think it was an enormous relief. He could tell these stories and could talk to us and could share memories that he'd kept tamped down for so long. An idea began to form in Welshman's mind that he should write his story. I seem to have a very special responsibility in that I was the only person alive with inside knowledge of a very telling episode in cryptologic history. In 1977, he also took the deliberate decision to appear on the BBC series The Secret War, which dared to reveal the still-classified story of ultra-intelligence. I don't know whether I should say this, but it seems to me that uh, some of the things really have been kept secret too long, that there is a, a point at which um, you do more damage by deceiving your own people about the true history of World War II than you could possibly do by telling now the stories as it actually happened. Determined to set the record straight, as well as to give public recognition to those whose work had been war-winning, Welshman had to write from his own prodigious memory and discreet research from former colleagues. He had no access to official papers, which were still classified. It was seven years' work. I think my father felt that he had an impo a very important insight on a particular piece of history, which very few other people had. And he just kept reading the obituaries and realizing that there were fewer and fewer people left. But Gordon Welshman, after a life spent in the secret world, didn't realize that world was about to turn on him. Gordon Welshman's book, The Hut Six Story, was published in the United States in February 1982 and in the UK the following May. For the first time in print, an insider's account of the full secret history of code breaking's role in World War II was laid bare. Importantly, 
it incorporated Welshman's use of traffic analysis. The book also included a warning. Welshman believed lessons from the war were being ignored. The Americans were making the very same mistakes with their security that the Germans had once made. He thought he could talk about this in a way that would reach the general public, that would not disclose any secrets, it would not tell tales you shouldn't. He hoped it would make some money, but he really hoped it would generate a conversation. The secret world didn't wait long to hit back. I was on my way to work, and this car speeded up and stopped right smack in the, almost in the middle of the road. Nobody stops there, so I had to see what was going on. Um, there's Gordon's house right there, and the two men jumped out wearing black suit, uh, black tie, and uh, black sunglasses. They looked like the men in black, and they raced across the street. Gordon answered the door, and you could see them, you know, busily discussing something. <laughs> and all of a sudden, Gordon took the door, and he slammed it almost in their faces. Later, I found out that it was a national security agency. There had been books about the ultra-secret prior to his uh, publication. Uh, there was no putting the toothpaste back in the tube. The secret was out. But Welchman's book was the first about cryptanalysis by an actual insider who had done it. It was still the height of the Cold War. If our continent were attacked, this red telephone would be lifted from its cradle. And instantly, the United States would launch the greatest counterattack in history. Signals intelligence remained at that time at the very heart of the intelligence conflict that was being conducted during the Cold War. So this was as important and as secret as it could get. I think that um, people who saw what he wrote felt he was imperiling current operations. Welshman's World War II work in traffic analysis might have been 40 years earlier. But what he had discovered was still so vital to the secret world that revealing it, even now, was considered dangerous. On February 22nd, 1982, the men in dark glasses returned. These uh, two young gentlemen came in, one from NSA and one from, I believe it was Air Force Intelligence. They said, well, this information has never been uh, declassified and therefore is still in violation of the wartime secrets laws. Gordon was taken aback. He said, this is, this is absurd. They were delivering a message to him, and it was an ominous message. I believe they had conversations with Mr. Welchman. Uh, beyond that, I'm not sure that uh, I can talk about anything meaningful. And it became clear the American authorities were not going to back off. Uh, it was really quite devastating. He was quite unprepared for that. Welshman enlisted the help of another writer who had fallen afoul of the NSA. We lived in the same area, so we could actually get together physically. And it's probably the kind of things that you don't want to talk over the telephone, especially when you're dealing with NSA. He couldn't do any publicity. He couldn't answer questions from reporters. He couldn't uh, uh, appear on television shows and so forth. And that was a really big problem. The NSA threatened Welshman with an obscure legal clause dealing with the sharing of cryptology. This same law is now being used on NSA whistleblower Edward Snowden. It's a part of the Espionage Act. I think it's 10 years in prison and a heavy fine. So these were very, very serious charges. I could see he was nervous. I, th I could see the physical effects that the NSA was having on him. That devastates somebody that spent their entire life trying to protect uh, uh, U.S. and British governments, and now they're being told that uh, they're going to be charged with a crime, possibly, of uh, giving 
uh, secrets to the enemy. He'll be prosecuted as maybe being a spy, or a, not a spy, but a, a leaker. There was one final act with devastating consequences. On April 29, 1982, Welshman's security clearance was withdrawn. All of a sudden, uh, he disappeared. Dear Mr. Welchman, the MITRE Corporation believes it would be mutually beneficial to temporarily suspend your access to classified materials. This suspension is effective this date. Please acknowledge receipt of this letter by signing in the space provided below. And he signed below. Rather than stay silent, Welshman went on the offensive, writing letters and articles which he hoped would exonerate him, including a recently discovered unpublished paper, Ultra Revisited, a tale of two contributors. The stories of Alan Turing's life and mine have two things in common. First, we were regarded by our boss as the two greatest contributors to the wartime success of Bletchley Park. Second, we have been branded as security risks. What has happened to me can be compared with what happened to Turing. For many in the intelligence community, Welshman was being naive to imagine he could reveal the secrets of Hut 6 with impunity. But he never lost his belief that this was information the public needed to know. With Welshman gagged by the security services, his book flopped. He sold only 900 copies. The rest were pulped. He suffered a lot. He uh, went through a great deal uh, to put Hut 6's story out. The strain was, was also coming at a, a very difficult time. He'd had uh, some more medical problems. It was a cruel irony that Gordon Welshman, a master of the clandestine world, who helped win World War II by breaking enemy codes and also helped the West win the Cold War by keeping their communications secret, would himself fall afoul of the secret state. I believe that the um, rules at the time about secrecy were really inflexible. The people who administered inflexible rules themselves had spent a full career being indoctrinated with the idea that secrecy was the base. I am today glad that the book is out. By now, Welshman was seriously ill with cancer. I'm not saying that he was blameless. But he had broken the procedures, and the law was never invoked. But he lost his job and his livelihood uh, without ever appearing in court or ever facing any criminal charge. And finally, you know, I think he realized that uh, it, it wasn't going to go away. They probably couldn't successfully prosecute him, but they would break him financially. Gordon Welshman never redeemed himself. On October 8, 1985, he died. It made two of the last three years of his life really quite hellish. But his legacy would continue. After his death, his methods and insights not only became part of the West's military thinking, they also became the very heart of the new intelligence networks as the world became more and more connected via computer. Uh, you may want to refer to the timeline that's printed on the back of your programs so that you can put some of the panelists' comments in perspective. I think that will be handy for you as we go forward with the panel. The panel is really in three parts. Diana Lucy, Roz Welchman, and um, a fourth of them up here, consisting of uh, four other people who knew Gordon when he lived in Newburyport. Uh, so first, um, we're going to hear from Diana Lucy. Diana is a longtime Newburyport resident who just happened to be in the dining room at 167 Water Street in 1974 when Gordon finally disclosed publicly for the very first time 
how he had spent his war years after keeping the secret for nearly 30 years. Diana was completely astonished by this when she heard this. She herself had been involved in the same code-breaking effort at another facility a few miles down the road from Bletchley Park. And she too had never disclosed that fact to anyone. Yes, it was a different world back in those days. This past July, Diana celebrated her 94th birthday. Like a number of us here tonight, she has not completely escaped the rigors of advancing age. She has experienced hearing issues for many years and they have progressed recently, so she's not able to tell her remarkable story before a large audience. And she's not able to hear questions or comments directed to her. However, a couple of weeks ago, we went to Diana's house on Water Street, just down the road from Gordon's old house, with videographer Kat Mazia, and with the invaluable assistance of Diana's daughter-in-law, Susan, and son, Ian, we asked Diana to tell us about that night at 167 Water Street, and perhaps say some other things about Gordon as well. We'd like to play that recording for you right now. I'm going to talk to you tonight about Gordon, the man that we all knew and loved, who came in retirement to Newburyport. And he was originally from England, and he was a rather lonely little boy. He had an older brother who was killed in the first month of World War I and an older sister, and that was it. So until he went off to school to Marlborough College, he was really rather lonely. But he showed in Marlborough College his mathematical brain and from then on his academic life just bloomed and um, I grew up a little later than Gordon but in a small village in England and spent two or three years in Italy with my parents then came back, had a normal school in England, and when I finished, I was in college studying speech and drama and was allowed to finish. The war broke out, but if you were already in college, you were allowed to finish. Coming out of college, I went into the WAF and uh, trained as a wireless operator, which was what we were known as the whole war. We were wireless ops. And at some point, they decided to train us to be intercept operators. And we were listening out to the Germans or their messages. And um, then we didn't know, but the reports that we took down all went to Bletchley. But of course, we didn't know anything about that. I first met Teeny, not Gordon. Gordon wasn't in the picture then. But I first met Teeny because she and her then husband were involved in an accident on Story Avenue coming back from Maine. And they both landed in the Anna Jakes Hospital. And I had them both as patients. Now, when they left 
they had the car was gone, totally smashed up. So I just gave them a key to this house and said, go let yourselves in and wait till we get home and Frank and I will give you a ride to the Pennsylvania station for Pennsylvania. And I thought, well, that's it. But anyway, lo and behold, Teeny started writing. So I was delighted because I liked her. And then a little while later, I had a phone call, which um, amounted to the fact that she was in Newburyport visiting a distant cousin. In all this, Gordon was established in the house. He bought the house. Just driving through Newburyport and loved it and looking for somewhere to settle in his retirement. All by himself, he did it. And anyway, uh, so I duly presented myself at the dress on Water Street for tea. And that's how I met Gordon, through Teeny. So, one night um, Teeny called and asked me, could I go to a supper party? He said, it's just fairly casual, and Dick and Brenda French will be there, who I knew. So I paddled up Water Street, and um, we had a lovely meal. Teeny was an excellent cook. And a general conversation. And then, out of the blue, really, Gordon announced, well, I have something to tell you. I am writing a book about my wartime experiences. And he just said, I worked at Bletchley and my mouth fell open and I just said, I don't know what I said. I could hardly speak because it was so secret. Nobody ever said anything. And then when I sort of got myself together and I said, and I was an, a, an operator, you know, taking down everything the Germans said. And Gordon came round and gave me a big hug and he said, I don't believe it. <laughs> and his answer to that was, well, I'm really glad to know. He said, as far as I was concerned, the fairies brought us the material. <laughs> you know, here we were in 1974 in Newburyport. And it was a million to one chance that you'd ever meet up with an operator like that. But um, he never, ever talked about what he did at Bletchley. It doesn't matter. No, I never asked him. And I, I never talked about what I did. I did talk to Gordon. Uh, not, uh, not at that point, but a little later. That took us up to what sort of uh, the time, the timing of his book, the coming out of the book. And he really got nothing but grief from various quarters over the pond and otherwise. But th apart from that, his, he was so positive 
about life in general, about the people he met, and he opened his arms to everybody, you know. But he did not get the recognition for what he did for a long time because he is one of the most important scientists and mathematicians to actually come out of World War II and at last he's been recognized for what he did. When Gordon was beginning to feel real pressure about his book and so forth, and he, uh, I was going to visit the family in England, and he asked me if I would take a paper for him, to, and I said, oh, yes, you know. And sort of got in this because he was getting really rather paranoid about the mail and sending everything uh, overseas. Anyway, so I sort of entered into the spirit of the thing, but it was stupid, really. So put on a big sloppy sweater, and the paper was like the big envelope stuck the envelope up the back and in my jeans and sloppy sweater off I went to England with Gordon. I didn't know what else to do with them really. Anyway, I, g I got through and delivered the paper uh, which was to um, I think it's in the book, Merriweather, Sir, somebody Merriweather. And it was Gordon really asking for a bit of help from Bletchley and people over there. And he was turned down. So he then, you know, he started to be much more reclusive and not a happy man and it was shortly after this where he had the diagnosis of being a serious cancer um, and from then on he became much quieter and he started, he started to have a, a little bit of a problem with drinking, which was very understandable. But anyway, he not long after he had the operation and did not last long. Um, then he was going to be cremated. And the morning of the cremation, Teeny called me and she said, Diana, Gordon is not going to ride alone in Todd's funeral car to Haverhill. Will you come with me? So I said, yes. And she said, I have dressed Gordon in his dark red smoking jacket, which he used to wear at certain times. So there we were, Gordon in the back and Todd, Teeny and myself in the front of the funeral car, driving up High Street in Newburyport. And there, believe me, there were a few popping eyes. <laughs> but Teeny was determined that Gordon would not go into this dark night by himself.
lady this is. And what a great story she has to tell. And Susan and Ian, I can't thank you enough for the help you've been. Susan's got a little gizmo that enables her to say something and then show it to Diana so that she can read it. Amazing. You yeah. Canadian accent. <laughs> <laughs> so the rules of this panel uh, specify that any panelist who has something to add to another panelist's remarks can simply signal and then make, go on and make the comments. So our next panelist is Gordon's daughter, Rosalind. Rosamund. Rosamund. I call myself Ross. <laughs> Well, that's a very difficult act to follow. <laughs> thank you very much, Diana, for that. And um, thanks to everybody who has organized this um, evening. I think Dad would be very, very pleased. Um, Ron said that we should. Uh, the panel, the job of the panel is to look for a different perspective, so I'll try to talk about things other than what you've seen in the film. Um, I can talk about my perspectives, um, but probably, I guess I didn't know about a lot of, a lot of what was in the film until I was, um, well, you know when, I mean, <laughs> until I was um, getting, getting on. Um, but, uh, and, and as I said, in, in the film, the, the the, uh, in childhood, we vaguely knew something had happened, but we didn't know very much about it. So I think I won't talk about that. Instead, I'd like to try to give you a bit more of a sense of who he was. Um, how many people here did know him? Oh my goodness, that's wonderful. And how many knew Teeny? Yes, I, I think more might have known Teeny through her work at Anna Jewett's. I'm not sure. Um, so, um, what can I tell you about? Um, he was a wonderful father. This is me as a, as a young woman. And, uh, he was tremendously supportive. I've been going through old letters and I can't believe how many letters he wrote to me. All through high school. And he was an amazing letter writer. And, and obviously, you know, I think at the time, possibly, I didn't appreciate that as much as I, uh, as I would like to, uh, would have liked to. Um, I think, um, wait, where are we? Here we go. This one. There we go. Um, with young children, this is a picture of him with my first child. And I don't know if you see, do you see a little bit of awkwardness in this picture? <laughs> and he was a proper English gentleman. And Englishmen often weren't awfully good with very young children. I mean, he really wanted to try to hold it, but he often said, well, you know, I'm really only good with children once I can read a book to them. <laughs> so, so his attitude, but still, we, we, we did. He could read many books to my children, and they did, did get to know him. Um, I would like to tell you a bit about his many, many enthusiasms, because I think the film talks a little bit about that uh, when he was a young man, how he did the mountaineering and the dancing and all those things. But that really went through his life. But he did tend to, sometimes, some of his enthusiasms were very intense, but fairly short-lived. Um, one of them was fishing, I and mean, he was the kind of, I don't know how many of you have got involved in fishing, but you know, he had all the best equipment, and, and he, when we went up to Vermont, uh, he, had, he was just, oh, passionate about it. Um, I think I maybe wasn't a very helpful little daughter, because I'd tag along with a bent pin and a piece of red cellophane and managed to catch fish when he did. <laughs> still, I think he forgave me for that, but he did drop fishing at some point. Um, gardening, I mean, being English, where I think we're all gardeners to some extent, but um, he didn't do much in Newburyport because that was Teeny's job. But before that, he lived in, um, in uh, Lexington and he had a house on a really nasty sort of rocky, dumpy slope. He, sometime around then, read the book by Thor Heyerdahl, um, Aku Aku, and got obsessed by rock gardening. Rock gardening meant moving enormous boulders by himself using the techniques described in that book. <laughs> I could not believe this garden, um, it was amazing. But then when he moved to Newburyport, I think possibly he'd had enough of that. So that was fun. <coughs> Um, another one that I, I was just looking through some of the things he gave me. Um, do you know about Mystery Hill? Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. Well, he got very interested in that at one point, and he, that was one of the Christmas presents one year to me. I have a book on Mystery Hill. 
Um, those were short-term things, though, that didn't last forever, but some long-term enthusiasms that went throughout his life. Um, well, the music. Um, the music uh, was um, something that went, I mean, you'll, you'll hear more about that later from Bunny, but let's see, how am I doing this? There, one more. Um, I inherited a lot of his odd bits of paper and so forth, and among the things that I inherited from him was a huge stack of sheet music. And <laughs> this, um, you might have, if you were listening closely to the introductory music, this is actually one of the magicals that we're playing, uh, Thomas Morley. You notice this is W.G. Welchman's Sydney, Sussex, Cambridge. And you can tell the date. It was priced as fourpence for this sheet music. <laughs> this was a long time ago. But what really touched me is in addition to his name up here, that's Gordon Welchman's copy, there's K. Welchman. That was my mother. That's how we met my mother. And um, obviously music meant a great deal to him. You'll hear about that. But I'm just so impressed that he actually kept this sheet music all his life. He didn't sing as far as I remember. I don't remember him singing except possibly hearing him in church, but, um, but he uh, certainly uh, loved, loved, loved music. Um, he was also very, very keen on visual arts. He um, was a great museum goer. He particularly liked, um, like, Corot, I believe, so early in, in the very early in <coughs> um, And he was very knowledgeable in that area. His, his, my first stepmother was an artist herself, and I think that had, you know, expanded that side of him. And I think that's partly what he saw in Newburyport, just the physical beauty and um, inside the house. I mean, this house, of course, is not terribly distinguished on the outside, but um, inside, I've got some pictures of actually later to show you um, uh, inside of that house. But, uh, let's see, I'm sorry, I'm not very, there we are. Um, he was always devoted to nature, and as a young man, also with family, um, we would travel all over the country with tents because we didn't have money and MIT young professor's salary didn't get you uh, much in the way of transportation so we'd do a lot of camping uh, uh, and my mother and three children would pack into a car and he was a very meticulous person you know we all had to stand back and look from a distance as every last bit of camping equipment got jammed into the trunk which was quite a feat it was really quite a kind of genius to do that but when he got to Newburyport, I think it was also the, um, he just loved Bon Island, he loved the water, he loved all of these things. Um, he loved birds. Um, he used to go birding a lot with my sister. Now, I have something here, this might look a bit mysterious. Um, I was looking through old letters. Now, this is actually written in 1984. Oh, this is one complaint I have about that film. My father never typed. He was of a generation. <laughs> Somebody else typed it for him. And when one place where they had him typing, they didn't have, it nearly get to his illegible script. So just in case you can't read this, um, uh, just to put this in context, this is a letter which had 16 pages. And it was at a time, it was 1984, obviously a lot was going on. There were things about the book, we had a lot of things going on in the family. There were all kinds of um, typical things. But right towards the beginning, here, half a page. Anyway, yesterday was a lovely spring day, and I had the man just got a new car for the first time. So I went to the island and saw several families of Canada geese with fluffy little goslings, only about eight inches long. One family of four goslings dived into the water only about 10 yards away and went for a swim with their parents. Fascinating. And that's what he chose to, I think that's rather nice, that that's you know, the, the sort of prelude to this letter with all the, Honestly, let's go. Anyway, he loved nature and he loved birds. Um, this one I think you've seen. Um, I was lucky enough to come up with my children. Uh, Dad and Jeannie and I spent many hours on um, Plum Island, and my children would have long debates about which was the best parking lot to go to. <laughs> and, uh, very, really appreciate it. Um, let's see, what's next? This is a picture, he loved doing this kind of thing. Can you see him in the picture? Yeah, yeah um, this is one of those, you know, rounded mirror. Um, it, it, it's a, it's quite a spherical mirror. And so he can take a picture and it shows the whole house, it's the inside. It's not a very good picture, but at least you can get the idea of what it looked like. Um, a little spot, they had this wonderful banister. I think that was one of the things he most liked about the car, about the house. Um, I'm 
a Mac person, this thing has a <laughs> So this is another picture on the inside her? of the house. You can see that, that uh, mirror there. I hope he was taking a picture of the house. Um, this really appeals to me a lot because I still have bits of this furniture. That's a picture of my my second, my first stepmother's. Um, she was a cubist um, of some renown. So I like to see these pictures. Um, Let's see what's what's next. I'm sorry, I'm getting hung up in this thing. Um, yeah, I think that that's that's really the last of them. Um, he settled in in Newburyport, and I think um, it was really an awfully good place for him. I mean, physical beauty, the the natural things, um, frequent visits, and for me it was lovely to come up so often with his grandchildren. Then of course he was writing his book and. Um, and also, I, I, I had the privilege of staying up here during his last summer and helping him write that last, um, last article. Um, he did have some difficulty towards the end, but I think he also had um, a great deal of, um, of pleasure in the town and, and, delighted it, and delighted in it. And now, of course, he is getting a lot of recognition. Um, this is, here's an idea of a report. This is from the Bristol Civic Society. This is a plaque in um, Bristol, where he was born, you can see, a uh, key contributor to World War II, British code breaking, born at former St. Mary's Vicarage, Bradley Road fish ponds, and baptized in this church. Now, I couldn't get to when they installed, they only installed this last year, but my sister went, and uh, because of that, she met people from, G, um, uh, from uh, GCHQ, and we are going to tea at GCHQ <laughs> next month, which is kind of wonderful. Now that sounds a bit luxurious, but let me tell you why we can do it. Because since um, Joel Greenberg's biography of him came out, and since that documentary, his book, which is still in print, sales skyrocketed. And we've got these enormous royalty checks. <laughs> I mean, if you're really interested in his life, I think Joel Greenberg's biography is wonderful. Also, if you Google it, um, about the same time that Joel was writing that book, and totally independently, there was a small theatre company in England called Idle Motion, which produced a six-player play with three, ev three events going on. It was Bletchley Park, it was the founding of the museum at Bletchley Park, it's now it's a museum, and, um, and the third one in between was my dad writing his book. Now there was one actor who was the same actor in, in you know throughout the whole play, and that was the guy who played my dad. And they were very pleased to see me there. They were very very nice. But that young man, he was so nervous about meeting his daughter. <laughs> it was really wonderful. But I think if you Google it, you might be, you might be able to find it. It used to be on YouTube. You can at least see a preview. It's called. That is all you need to know. And the theater company is called Idle Motion. It was quite good. It made it to the Edinburgh Fringe Festival, so it was pretty well recognized. All right, that's all I have to say. Gentlemen, ladies, it's time. Ross, are you going to take this last seat up here? If you watch the documentary really closely, you may see some familiar faces here. On the end is Jay Stevens, the lawyer. The lady who saw the men in black come to Gordon's house. <laughs> All right, left to right, panelists. Uh, Jay Stevens, for many years a prominent attorney in Newburyport and law partner of Harvey Beat. Um, uh, Jay lives now in North Carolina, South, South Carolina. Carolina. South Carolina. Beautiful. Beautiful. Uh, but gets up here once a month or so for um, on legal business. 
Uh, next to Jay, we have Gordon's uh, spiritual colleague, uh, Reverend Bert Steves. Bert uh, was the pastor of the First Religious Society, Unitarian Universalist, on uh, Pleasant Street for 38 years before retiring in 1994. Uh, he'll tell you about his relationship with Gordon. Marilyn Westcott, Buddy, known as Buddy to most people around here, uh, who with uh, his, her husband Ross moved to her retirement home in Maine recently after 42 years in Newburyport. And Sky Wentworth, another longtime resident who works as a book publicist and lives uh, today on Boardman Street. Uh, lived across the street for Boardman at one point. Um, and of course, Ross Welchman, whom you already have heard from. Uh, let's begin with you, Jay Stevens. Uh, you, pro you provided legal counsel for Gordon when his book was published and was challenged by the American and British governments. Talk about that a little bit. Can you hear me out there, all right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, go back. Uh, I met Gordon, uh, actually I met Taney first. Taney had come to see me about a matter uh, that related to her former husband. And Gordon came along for moral support. I can't tell you exactly what the date was, but it was sometime in, in uh, the late 1970s, I think it was. And uh, at some, uh, I guess it must have been a lull in the conversation or, or whatever it was, I don't recall the details. Uh, Gordon was there and I was there with him and I obviously knew he was British. So I just uh, was chatting it out, you know, how things go in the, you over there in the war and so forth and so on. And he said, yes. And I said, what were you, what were you doing at that time? And he said, I can't tell you. No question about it. So that, that was, I'm guessing that might have been late 70s, 77, 78, 79, in that time period. Um, the next major encounter that I had with Gordon, and I think it was the next time that I actually saw him, uh, he contacted me and he said that uh, he wanted to, that he had been approached by the men in black. He didn't characterize it that way, but he said that two fellows from Security, so the National Security Agency and, and some other uh, domestic security and military security outfit had come to his home and wanted to interview him. And he seemed, uh, uh, I won't say blase, but he was uh, comfortable about it. He said, I thought it was better if I do that in my lawyer's office or in a lawyer's office rather than uh, at my home. So would that be all right if, uh, if they came to your office and uh, interviewed me there. I didn't make much of it because he, he didn't seem to be making much of it. And of course, I didn't really know much about Gordon Welshman at that time or anything about his background. So uh, we met at my office, 53 State Street, up over the old First and Ocean Bank. And uh, these two, Gordon came in and these two fellows showed up. Well, you knew they were uh, security or military. They weren't in black, but you know, they had the, uh, like, just like Ron is over here. <laughs> <laughs> so they had the blazers on and, you know, the dark clothes, military haircuts, uh, very uh, official looking fellows, fairly young. I would say they probably were both in their late 30s, uh, early 40s, something like that. And uh, they got right down to business, asked Gordon several questions about his book, and, uh, and he confirmed, of course, that he had published it. I don't think there was much of uh, any questions about content at that time. They, they, uh, they got right to the point, and they said, uh, you know, uh, the publication of this book is I think they used the, the, viola the violation of the Espionage Act. Uh, they brought, they mentioned some draconian uh, uh, sanctions that could be applied, criminal sanctions, 
for publishing this book uh, and if he put it out uh, into the public. And they said, you're not to do that. You're not to talk about this and you're not to disseminate it. You're not to, uh, and not to uh, do anything further as far as this book is concerned. The book was already published. It was in place. So this was, uh, this was all, uh, we, I think we were both taken aback, I certainly was, that uh, had not expected anything of this sort. I thought it was more of an informational gathering uh, interview that they were interested in. And I think Gordon uh, largely did too. But uh, uh, Gordon said, uh, you know, this is absolutely absurd. This technology that I was involved with in 1939 and 1940 has absolutely nothing to do with what's going on in the world today. And they uh, simply reiterated the threat to him. Uh, and, and that was it. And we closed the conversation and they got up to leave. And as, as they were heading out, one of the fellows had a briefcase with him. Maybe they both did, but one fellow had his briefcase. And he looked over at Gordon, he opened the briefcase, and he said, oh, by the way, uh, Dr. Welton, would you autograph my coffee? <laughs> You know, great relief to us. These guys really aren't that serious. They're just uh, bring, delivering a message on behalf of somebody else, and that there's nothing too much to worry about. So after they left, Gordon and I chatted, and I knew nothing. I knew nothing about this area of the law, and uh, obviously he didn't because he wasn't a lawyer. And he said, "What do you think we should do?" And I said, "Well, why don't I see if I can find out." Uh, more about w whether this is really something you need to be worried about or not. I mean, here they, they're saying, you know, there's a potential for uh, violating an espionage act and uh, heavy duty uh, criminality that goes with it. Uh, so I really, I, I had no knowledge of anybody in that field or where to turn. So I, I contacted somebody from the American Civil Liberties Union and I told them briefly what the situation was. I said, do you know anybody whom I could call to find out what the best uh, tactic would be with this threat pending out here? And they gave me the name of a, an attorney in Washington, D.C. I have no memory of who it was, but anyway, they said he's an authority on this type of uh, business. So I called that person, and he was, he was very nice and very firm, and he said, do nothing. They won't do anything. They will not prosecute him. He doesn't need to worry about that, at least the criminal charges. He does not need to worry about that. The best thing to do is just ignore it. So I passed that information on to Gordon. And, uh, and uh, of course, no action, no criminal action was taken. We had no, uh, Gordon and I had no further uh, contact. I, I mean, as we see him occasionally, sort of socially on the street or around town, but legally, uh, nothing more developed as far as I was concerned about that. It was only later on that I became aware of that he had lost his security clearance, which was sort of the, their last revenge and, and about the only card that I think they really had any intention of, of uh, pulling. But that was my involvement uh, with Gordon, and that, that little piece of his life, that, that very unfortunate piece of his life. thing that's important to me. Sunday morning, I was coming down out of the pulpit, walking up the main aisle, and I saw this gentleman coming on a side aisle, and I could see that we were going to meet. 
And he came along and he said, my name is Gordon Marshman. I belong to the Episcopal Church. <laughs> he said, now let, let me tell you what happened. I was talking to one of my friends at the Episcopal Church. I was explaining to him that my father had been a warden in the church and the rituals were very important to me. They were the background of my life. Then he said, I was talking to this fellow at St. Paul's, and he said to me, you don't seem to be too happy about something. So I told him, I liked all of the rituals, but there was no social action. The church did not seem to be involved in the social life of the community. And Gordon said, my friend said to me, why don't you go down to Pleasant Street to Unitarian Church? <laughs> so he came down and he said to me, as I've said before, the ritual is important, the social action is important. Is it okay with you if I come here one, one week and go to St. Paul's the next week? <laughs> and that's the way it went on for quite some time. The, uh, we would meet occasionally and always, you know, very fine friends. And I was always amazed at him. He was always seemed so normal, so humble for a man as brilliant as he was and had done as much as he had done. And I would be with him in the library. We would discuss things and sermons. And he loved to talk about my sermon. <laughs> wasn't always converted. <laughs> but the only thing that I the thing that I remember the most about him and it's very painful to me still after all these years we were in the first national bank and the first second bank and he, he said to me you know the FBI is after me this is what Jay was talking about he said they threatened me with jail if I write my book. And all of this material has already been published. He said, I feel as though my adopted country has turned its back on me. And the one thing that I've always remembered was how badly I felt for him, knowing full well that this country had not turned its back on God and on Rosman. And I thank you for anything you have to say. Marilyn Westcott, uh, the subject of music and Gordon's relationship with music has been uh, bandied about a little bit already. Tell us, tell us more about that. Um, I wonder if I could come over there just because I'm going to have sure. to push a button on the tape. I don't know. Uh, I just wanted to say, Diana Lucy it was who introduced me to Gordon and Teeny back in the fall of 1974 when I moved to Newburyport to set up Opportunity Works for the Developmentally Disabled. It was a busy time for me. As you know, Gordon was writing his book and Teeny and Diana were both working full time at the Anna Jakes Hospital. Nevertheless, we uh, socialized energetically and frequently. I think um, it was uh, a little awkward, but because of Gordon's great interests, we did find commonality because math wasn't my strong suit. <laughs> and so our commonality was in travel and uh, foreign lands and in mountaineering and in music. Uh, his musical interests were wide ranging from choral to classical, uh, Baroque and music hall and uh, show tunes. He was mad about madrigals and he had sung in a madrigal group in England and he was uh, pleased to compare notes because I was in a madrigal group here locally called the Apollo Consortium. He used to sit 
uh, in his recordings area on the top floor of his house overlooking the Mar mouth of the Merrimack and he would play for friends pieces that struck him at the moment that he wanted to share and he also stayed up there and on Monday nights uh, had uh, ongoing uh, evenings with Dick French who was a teacher at the Newburyport High and they both would share recordings uh, for each other. So he made a cassette tape programs and they would range from serious to humorous and these programs he took to nursing homes in the area, Brigham Manor, uh, Country Manor, Worcester Park, which is no longer, and I just found out he even took his uh, musical programs to the Railway Senior Center. And he played these tapes on a pioneer boombox, <laughs> but he really coveted my Panasonic. <laughs> you might say he had boombox envy. <laughs> this boombox, which is here tonight and still plays faithfully, uh, played all the memorial music uh, for his service in 1985 at the Unitarian Church at the service where Bert Steves officiated. I've prepared a little sample from some pieces that he recorded f for me. I still have the original tapes with his very detailed handwriting on them of each piece. So I'll give you a little sample. You can hear some at the end that we'll play a, a longer selection of if, if you uh, have time to hear it. expectantly, 
while he held the mouse by the tail, dunking it absolutely on and on while he talked. <laughs> to this day, Diana and I still don't know whether he was putting us on. <laughs> of course, he must have known. He also was a little disgruntled about playing games. Uh, that's funny for a code breaker, but he, he really thought it was a waste of time. Well, we played a game we call Fictionary, where you have to convince other people that you have the proper definition. So it came up that the word was FIP, FIP. So we all read the definitions, and one of them turned out to be Gordon's, and it was fairly important person. <laughs> When I made a spoof of his jacket cover, which you can see a photocopy of out on the photo board where you entered, uh, entitled The Hot Sex Story, <laughs> he kept his reserve and I felt he did not approve. <laughs> but ever the gentleman, he did not express it to me. He was always the gentleman. Diana once told me, if he changed his women, it was through the divorce courts. <laughs> I once asked him, Gordon, what is the definition of a gentleman? His reply caught me totally off guard. Someone who would like to, but doesn't. <laughs> Matchbox toys, and that would keep my children busy. 
Um, when Gordon's book came out in February of 1982, at the very beginning, we were just all delighted. And it was a wonderful thing. And uh, Gordon did have uh, book events, and we enjoyed it. And along came uh, Gordon's 70th, 76th birthday. And our family thought we want to do something that is really meaningful to wish Gordon a happy birthday. So we decided that we would also honor his book. And we looked at it and we saw where they, he talked first about the history of communications and how uh, at the very beginning they would have the wigwag flags. So each flag represented, you know, a different letter. Uh, I made some cloth flags, red and white flags, and we, we stuck them on sticks. And the night before Gordon's birthday, uh, they were at home. And I thought, great, we'll, we'll practice. And so uh, my husband and I went across the street, and my daughter's bedroom window was upstairs, right directly across the street. And she would stick her head out, and she'd lean forward, and she's doing the wigwag, and the other daughter was doing the, the other way. And we we're looking at this, and all of a sudden, uh, the blue lights started <laughs> bursting. <laughs> and, and the policeman showed up and wanted to know what we were doing. I think we might have had light, the, all these lights on, and anyhow, that was really funny. But the next day, we called Gordon and we said, Gordon, uh, grab your book, your, your uh, Hut 6 book, go to page, and we said, I think it might have been 22 or something, and bring your notebook and go to the front window, which he did. And so uh, my daughters, <laughs> one in each window holding the flags, they spelled out, happy birthday. <laughs> But with each letter, Gordon would write it down. <laughs> and then he would look up at us and he'd go like this. <laughs> it was really, really cute. Um, and then, of course, you know, as you saw in the film, that I happened to be on my way to work the day um, that the men in black showed up. And they were truly the men in black. I mean, they wore the, the skinny black suits, the black tie, those sunglasses, and the short haircuts. And they <coughs> came flying down the street, stopped the car with a jerk, just jumped out of the car and ran to Gordon's <coughs> door. Now, it's interesting because it seemed to me that Gordon thought something was up because they talked very briefly. And when they were leaving, and they left just as fast as they came in. Um, Gordon just took that tour and he did that long <laughs> slam. <laughs> so I knew that something serious was happening. And later on, of course, we all talked about it and found out what was happening. Uh, I have one more story that I'll tell you. There were lots of stories, and yes, we loved going for nature walks, and uh, Gordon loved Plum Island, and the birds, and everything about nature. I often, when Gordon was sick, would, even when he was in a hospital in Boston, would bring him in wildflowers, and he loved identifying. And I would try to find ones that I didn't think he would know. Like eggs in a basket. I mean, who knows that flower? You know? But Gordon did, and it, it was really wonderful. Um, w at the end of Gordon's life, um, and he knew he was going to die, he wanted to um, die at home. Um, and that meant that Teeny was his primary uh, caregiver. And I began to see where Teeny needed help. And this was really taking a little bit of a toll. 
There was that thing where you always wonder, um, if I go over there, am I going over at the wrong time? Or am I, if I bring over this chicken casserole, will they have another six casseroles waiting for them in the refrigerator? So our uh, family got together and we decided we would have a breakfast brunch on a particular Sunday. And we invited all, as many of Gordon's friends and his doctors that we knew. And uh, this was uh, late in the fall of, of the year that he died. And so we had a big brunch. And I had taken one of my daughter's uh, paint easels, and I got a large calendar. And I draped it over the easel, and I said, we all wanted, Gordon himself really wanted to come over and was coming over that day, but he couldn't. He was just too sick. But Teeny was there, and she just loved this because she also was very organized and liked it when she knew it was going to happen. So what we did is uh, we filled in this calendar. Who can bring a, ca a casserole or who could bring food on what night? Who will come and sit with Gordon and give Teeny the afternoon off? Who will sit and listen to music with Gordon? Um, it was really fabulous uh, how many people gave. And really, at the memorial service when Gordon did die, so many people came up and they were so joyous. We all were that we were able to help out and be a part of his dying, really, but to bring life and to remember him and just to uh, enjoy every minute of his life. When Diana was talking about um, bringing Gordon's ashes to Haverhill, which is so funny, and, and Teeny called me up and she said, we're putting that smoking jacket on. That's going on right away. But she said, there's one thing that happened this morning. And I said, what? And she said, and now we're at October 8th. She said, one rose, a white rose bloomed this morning. And that's going in the lapel of his smoking jacket. That's what he's doing. Every panel that I moderated had guys like you on it. I'll tell you, <laughs> wonderful story. And and doesn't it tell you something about the Newbury Court of the Times too? It was that kind of place that people brought food over and they called and invited the new neighbors to dinner. It's kind of nice. Kind of nice to think about it. Um, I have one more task. Not a task. It's it's a thing I want to do. Um, that's to thank a whole bunch of people. And I hope you'll indulge me while I do that. I'll just try to do it rather quickly, and then we want to open the um, floor to any of you who have stories or questions or anything about about Gordon Wilson. So people to thank before we uh, go into your questions. Uh, this program tonight truly has been a collaborative effort between the Friends of the Newburyport Public Library and the Museum of Old Newbury. Um, the uh, president of the Museum of Old Newbury, uh, executive director, I'm sorry, Susan Edwards, is here tonight somewhere. Susan, where are you? <laughs> Susan Edwards. The president of the Friends of the Library is not here, Nancy Peace. Yeah. At least I don't think she is. No, she's not. Uh, but both of these people have been, these women have been terrific in terms of the support they've given us over the past year that we've been working on this. I, I, truly wonderful. Uh, our hardworking program committee. I'd like to have them stand as I say their names so that you can recognize them. 
Hold your applause till the end, please. First, teacher, historian, Newburyport native, Jean Doyle. Representing the Museum of Old Newbury, Emily Schaefer, where is Emily? There she is in the back. Boston attorney and recent retiree, Tom Mila. There he is, way in the back. Uh, Bunny Westcott, already introduced as part of the panel. Bunny. And last but not least, David Jones, whose good idea this was. Sarah Hayden, David Kramer, and the staff of Port Media, especially Katerina Muzia. Did I do it right? Yeah. All right, good. Our videographer. Yeah. Taking the entire program for future viewing, either on Community Access TV or maybe as, a, as another program of this sort, except all on tape. Uh, Dan Fianti. Uh, running the registration process at the door and the reception that's going to follow this this uh, program, uh, Kathy Malin and Peg McClure of the Museum of Old Newbury Program Committee. Okay, now we'd like to open it up to questions and comments and stories from the audience. We're very much hoping there are others in the audience who have some stories that they would like to share with us. Um, Emily Schaefer has a traveling mic, and she will get to you. Please wait for her uh, so that your question can, or comment can be heard uh, clearly by everyone, and so we can pick, be sure to capture it on tape. Okay, uh, questions, comments? Anything about what you've heard today? Yes. I'm Betsy Newman, an historian. Hold the microphone and, right yes, up. And we knew Gordon in his last years and teen. And the thing that strikes me is that really, really hard for us was that he was not recognized. And so this program is phenomenal. And I would like to say that the people who own the house that he lived, that he and T lived in, uh, yeah, Ann, Ann Dodge and Chuck Kennedy are in Mexico. Yes. But I know, we know how much that means to them that that was where the Welshmen's lived. So when you go by way and think about the wonderful history that they're perpetuating at their B&B, and it's just glorious that you did this program. Thank everyone, I think every one of you deserves all sorts of credit. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad you brought that up because uh, Ann and Chuck were members of our program committee for a while, as you know. And um, uh, if we had put it on in October, which was the original plan, they would have been here. But uh, as, as you also know, they spend a lot of time in Mexico around this time of year and are not available. But they, they were very, very helpful to us. <coughs> Other questions, comments, stories? I'd like yes. to know where he's buried in Germany. Ah, interesting that he is buried in Germany, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I've been there. Oh, okay. Is it near the Kimsee? Uh, no, it's up in the, um, it, it's up in the German Alps towards, um, towards um, Austria, in the town where Tini grew up. And um, it turned out, uh, I think they rather hoped he could be buried in the cathedral. 
but, um, Bristol, where his father was archdeacon, but uh, it turned out they were rather expensive. <laughs> I guess at that point they weren't <laughs> into recognizing so much. And so he decided he loved the mountains, he loved oh, the mountains. He's and so he's, yeah. he's in, in the um, Cuba, her family was Cuba. In, in that. There was an amazing story about Tina getting the ashes there. Okay. Yeah. When she came out, do you remember that story? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, she, Tini was a very practical woman, and she was flying over. Yeah, we can't hear you. She was flying over to Germany, and she certainly didn't want to um, bother with carrying a heavy urn. It was enough to carry the ashes, so she figured she'd take the ashes and get the urn there. And so she goes to, you know, gets it all set up for the service and the interment of the ashes and the urn. Then she goes to buy the urn in a funeral parlor, and. Um, all right, chooses a nice one, gets all ready, and then she sort of says, well, would you mind pouring the ashes in? Because I feel a bit squeamish about that. And suddenly, bureaucracy burst forth in all its glory. What? Where did those ashes come from? You imported a death <laughs> Where's the paperwork? I need the paperwork. And so she spent a frantic day running around getting all the paperwork done. But the amazing thing about Tini was her spirit was so strong and she was such a realistic and humorous woman that when she herself was suffering from um, cancer and in, in hospice care, um, she made a big joke out of this and how um, she told the story and about how well at least now she could tell her son how to do it. <laughs> and they get all the papers do this and this and this. <laughs> and she's there also. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Ron, I, I, I have a question. Yes. Uh, I think I can yell it out. Yes. Did MIT provide any recognition of, of his work there and teaching at MIT? Not that I'm aware of. Not that I know of. I mean, he would have been an instructor, and it was only for a year or so. And I'm not sure that. Um, I don't know. Maybe you should ask the computer science department sometime what they think about that. Yeah. Other questions? Comments? Stories? Yes. I oh, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Right, of course. I saw the movie, the cover batch movie, about likely um, maybe two years ago. And I'm really surprised given the contributions of our Newburyport resident. There was nothing in the movie. And does anybody know why he was left out? Well, I think I can answer that. Um, that was a movie made by Hollywood. It's yeah. Very bad history. Um, I'm actually rather glad he was left out because the way they, the way they portrayed um, everybody else at, at, um, at Bletchley apart from Turing was sort of as buffoons who were obstructions, obstructionists. So I was glad. Um, the um, you know, the, the head one who was um, yeah. meant to be so critical of Turing in the movie, um, Alistair Dennison, his family was very upset by that movie because the spirit of Fleshley Park was entirely supportive. I mean, everybody supported everybody else. There was none of that kind of feeling of um, obstructing. And also, I don't think, I think at Fleshley Park, um, as far as I gathered, um, they were extremely, you know, all the boundaries, um, related to gender or sexuality or anything like that didn't exist at Bletchley Park. Turing's problems came afterwards, not Bletchley. And so I think that was just a question, I think Brenda, my, my interpretation, maybe I shouldn't say this, is that Brendan Cumberbatch had had such success with the autistic genius in Sherlock Holmes, they decided to make the film in that model, but it's not good history. Thank you. Anything else? Let me bring on David Jones. David Jones is the guy who put this all together and had the germ of an idea a year ago when we went to um, Chicago and talked about it for an hour. And we said, wow, there's something here. And I hope you've enjoyed it. But David. Oh, 
I'll make this uh, short and sweet. Um, reception this morning. Um, but uh, a year ago this February, my son was visiting from out of state. And early in his visit, we were sitting on our couch, just sort of catching up, my wife and my son and, and I. And TV was on in the background, but the volume was down. And at one point, my son said, wait a minute, there was just something here that said Newburyport on it. So we turned up the volume, and lo and behold, it was a BBC documentary about Gordon. And I was stunned. And I thought, I have to be the last person in Newburyport who knows about Gordon Welchman. And I had recently joined a, a local discussion group called News and Views. And the very next meeting, I went to it and I said, I'm sure you all know about Gordon Wilson, but I do. And it turned out there were three people out of 30 who actually knew him and or knew about him. And I thought, this can't stay the way it is. Um, we all know that Newburyport attracts, you know, interesting, uh, distinguished uh, people. Look at all of you. <laughs> all of us. Um, but I thought this really warrants something. And, uh, and I have to say, uh, I have uh, tremendous gratitude to the friends of the library um, and the museum of old Newbury for getting behind this for Ron and for Emily doing a fabulous job of putting it together. And I just hope that we might at some point in the future be able to have a more permanent recognition for Gordon. Have, no, have lots of ideas, but nothing, no plans. Uh, but would welcome uh, thoughts uh, by any of you uh, in, in this regard. So thank you again for coming out on a gloomy night, uh, but it was really a wonderful program. The panelists did a superb job, and Gordon Welchman is really something uh, that Newburyport should be very proud of. And uh, so I thank you all. Thank you. out in the front by the photos for anyone who uh, is interested in perhaps um, his legacy, try to make his legacy more permanent. To make his legacy more permanent. Please feel free to sign up. Well, for upcoming news. For upcoming news. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much.